Welcome DOD Innovators. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I am Captain Ashley Hollingsworth, Chief of the Director's Action Group at the Chief Data and AI Office. As your moderator, I am thrilled to be a part of this month's Innovation Connect. Before we dive into the fascinating topic of the day, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules. If you are not a presenter, please keep your camera off and your microphone on mute. If someone has a live microphone while our speaker is presenting, please allow the moderators to mute that microphone. Additionally, please limit your questions to the topic and avoid any media related inquiries or promotions of your company or organization. Please submit all questions through the chat. Today's presentation highlights the Army's innovative efforts to pave the way for data centricity with a tactical edge. Without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed speaker. We are honored to have Mr. Stephen Drake, Senior Network and Systems Operations Research Leader with the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Data, Engineering, and Software. He holds a master's degree in Systems Acquisition Management from the Naval Postgraduate School and a bachelor's degree in Geophysics from the University of Texas at El Paso. He served on active duty for over 26 years with the U.S. Army in the air defense and acquisition fields. His last military assignment was as the Director for Army Interoperability Certification Testing. After leaving active duty, he spent 12 years as the Director for Network Interoperability, Integration, and Testing for companies supporting system of system integration and testing of command and control systems across the Army. He recently joined the Army Civilian Acquisition Corps and is a DAU certified in program management and contracting. We are excited to hear from our distinguished speaker today. The floor is yours, sir. Hey, thank you very much. I really appreciate that introduction. Hey, team, today what I wanted to lay out for you is what the Army is doing to move to a data centric approach for how we will execute data operations and our future war fight. And so if we would go to the next chart, please. So before I get started on laying out uh, what the unified data reference architecture is and how it fits into the Army's data strategy and the data and war fighting strategy for the future, I wanted to start with uh, giving a little bit about what the organization is that I work in. So if you go to the next chart, please. DASA DES is an organization established uh, last year by the uh, ASALT of the Army, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics and Technology, in order to help drive digitization, digital transformation within the Army. Um, our focus really is about data engineering and, and sys, uh, software. Um, we have a hot mic out there. So um, basically what we have is um, our vision is to really help the Army uh, move to a data centric approach, but we recognize the fact that you know there's a lot that needs to be done to move us in that direction. Uh, so we're working on engineering pathways for digital transformation across various areas. Our, our strategy really is to cultivate you know and empower the Army's acquisition and other organizations within the Army that we have to work with in order to understand and develop paths forward for how we will transform ourselves and make ourselves more agile to the use of data. And so what we work on is creating architectures such as you see here, the Unified Data Reference Architecture. Um, we also provide some training and we're right now working on different training packages for different personas within the acquisition field. And we also engage with programs to learn where their pain areas are when they try to execute agile software development. And that includes moving them to a data centric construct. And so we spend our time right now trying to establish a path forward for the Army. And this UDRA is part of that overall strategy. So if we go to the next chart, I want to lay out for you first, you know, what we have today. And I don't know how it is in other services. I imagine it's pretty similar from what I understand from JADC2, but you know, the current data environment in the Army is complex, right? We have right now been focusing on networks 
and on systems themselves in order to become digitized. And, and that effort supported us, you know, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. But as we move forward today, the rate at which we must expose data, support the warfighter in providing data, and ensure that our data is transparent, not only within the Army, but also to our joint coalition partners makes this untenable. This does not allow our data in this fashion to be used by anybody else except those systems that are interconnected. It's very difficult to expose it outside those networks and outside those systems. So we need to move to a different construct. And based on what the DOD strategy is uh, with getting to a data-centric approach, what the Army has looked at as to why we are having such a problem uh, exposing our data, we all learned that you know moving to a data-centric approach is the way to go. But how do you do that? What's the focus there? If we'd move to chart four, please. The idea is the Army has settled on is this idea of coming up with a decision-driven data conops, concept of operation, and a data ecosystem, which takes into consideration your know, people, tech, process, and working together to expose the data. So what we have come up with, with this idea that we will leverage something called the data mesh concept. The data mesh concept overarchingly really focuses on the consumer of the data and the producer of the data and moving data through a data product construct. But the idea underpinning all that is getting the data out of systems, right? Abstracting it from the systems, abstracting it from the network. And that really is what we are focusing on accomplishing with the Unified Data Reference Architecture. How do we do that? So that we basically have the decision makers getting the data they need from the data domains, using mesh services that we'll talk about, you know, being supplied by the data platforms. There's in the idea of analytic layers that will allow the data to be modified and used and, and, and learned from, and then visualize that response of the data so that you can answer the questions that you see that the commanders have as any commander would have in a war fight right where are my units you know where are my partners and allies where and what can i we exploit with respect to the enemy and follow on actions those type of questions are what data products that we will produce out of using this data mesh concept through the unified data reference architecture to allow the data to be provided by the producer and provided to the consumer in a timely fashion so that we are able to get to that point in time where we're able to mass our forces in order to basically defeat the enemy. And so the idea behind this whole concept is though that the data product and that the consumer drives the data product. So the consumer being the decision maker they drive the demand for data products and the data products are produced by the domain experts in order to satisfy that. So next chart, please. So if we look at it from a military lens and we think about what we do today, this idea of data domains and, and data products isn't brand new, right? The concept exists, if we think about it, in the sense of these warfighter mission areas. We have warfighter mission areas today, such as mission command, such as fire, such as logistics, such as intel. These all are domains where data is produced. So we think about it and we move from left to right. You know, you have these different sensors out there, websites, databases, that are producing decision-driven data, right? They then support those different data domains, you know, if we look at it from a warfighting missionary lens, right? Intel, fires, maneuver, right? Sustainment, protection. And those um, different domains are actually producing products today, right? Manually, but they are producing products today that will allow information to be moved, you know, from those domains into the commander's talk so that the tactical operations center where the commander sits, you know, the, his staff can analyze those and provide an understanding to the commander so they can make data-driven decisions. So this idea of moving to a data-centric approach isn't 
far-fetched, right? It is something that in concept we know today, we just need to figure out how to get the data available so that it can move and go where it needs to go and not be tied to specific systems and networks, which basically keep our data from being voltus. So move to the next chart, please. So if we take that approach, now we look at a core mission essential task list, right? And we'll look at something specific, you know, defeating enemy integrated fires. So, you know, you have the coloring there, red being enemy information, blue being friendly information, but you think about it, right? So you have Intel Enterprise and the Intel community already produce data, right? They have data coming in from different locales and different systems already. Likewise, you have data sources in the division level, right below the core. You have the the, the uh, concept of operations for what the division is doing, the the uh, commander's operational picture. You have the combat power assessment happening, staff running estimates, and what those things do is they feed up, right? They get coalesced into um, cons consumer producer data domain products that are being used, right, in the Intel community or in the core level. Uh, operations community, as you see there. And if you keep moving to the right, you see data products there. And so they are actually taking that information and producing data products today, things like what you see, the threat overlay, the enemy situation, right, and their courses of action, uh, situation estimates, C2 running estimates, all those things are being produced today, right? And they feed then into an, you know, another domain area, right, which would be the G3 integrating um, the warfighting functions for the operations process, as well as in the fires community, right? They're creating these data products, but they're a different domain. And those products then uh, feed into all, overarchingly what the commander's request was for understanding how they can defeat the enemy integrated fires. And that feeds up to the, the core um, cop, right? And, and in a joint or coalition environment, it will provide the core commander the understanding they need in order to make a decision as to what course of action to take in order to defeat you know, the enemy integrated fire. So you know, today, some of these terms, as you see here, are, are, are known, right? Some of these products are known, right? What we're talking about now is how do we move to an abstracted set of data that will produce these automatically? So if we go to the next chart, please. And that's where the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition Logistics and Technology has been looking at defining the unified data reference architecture. Why is this important? It's because it adopts this data mesh principle of data product basically being produced by the domain and given and fed to the consumer or pulled by the consumer, right? It, flattens the Army's data structure because it abstracts the data from the network, from the systems, right? And, and focuses on the data itself and how do you get data to where it needs to be. It doesn't talk in terms of systems at all. It talks purely in terms of data and how do you move data? How do you govern the data? How do you ensure the data is voltus? And it aligns with the Army's uh, campaign plan for data centricity, the Army Data Plan, and we have a center of excellence that works on the mission command area, and they've produced a decision-driven data CONOPS, and that CONOPS has been imbued with this unified data reference architecture construct, and it shows by looking at it that it will provide the Army the needed data-centric approach to meeting the warfighter's needs in the future once implemented. And once we get this reference architecture to its point where we can deliver the full uh, 1.0 version of it, uh, we expect then to it becoming part of what's required in contract vehicles for the vendors who are supporting us in producing you know, command and control data, they will have to abide by. And by doing this, um, we believe that we will be able to begin to move the Army away from the system slash network approach to a data centric approach. Next chart, please. So 
So when you look at the unified data reference architecture, as we have been talking, there are some key terms we need to make sure we are all in you know, understanding. So we have the data mesh, right, which is the architecture uh, and, and the concept of decentralizing the approach to analytical data production right, and management. And it's all about basically data domain owners who own the data, right, who are the experts in that data, recognizing their responsibility and having their data production being governed by an overall construct to ensure that the data they produce and the data is put into a data product, that data product then is basically registered and then supplied you know, to the consumer when requested. And so, you have, okay, so, um, so basically what you have is the, the overarching data mesh construct and, the, and a key concept of that is the production of the data product, right? The data product is the actual product that not only has the data in it, but also has the metadata describing the information. And it's done in a mesh conforming uh, fashion such that it meets the DOD's Volcus goals for data centricity. And so we'll talk about some of these things as we go on here. Data domain then is you know, where the data is produced uh, by the owning organization for the data. And then they expose that information and, and more about the information in the data catalog, right? And they leverage the data platform in order to produce their actual a data product. So if you think about a library, you know, as a way to think about this, right? So data product is the book. And then the data domain is the is the library where the books are on shelves, right? And so there's a lot of information there. Now you want to figure out what information exactly are you going to be able to get to that you're looking for, right? And so that is how you know the data, the catalog, the card catalog, you know, comes into play and how it kind of fits this data product catalog where we have information that is stored separately from the actual data, right? That's in the data product, but it's all the information about the data that's in the data product so that anybody looking for information will be able to search for using this data product catalog. So it exposes an understanding of what data it is, where that data is, how to get to that data, how to pull the data. And then when you look at the data platform, it's all those tools and services needed in order to create the data product, right? And expose the data, right? Through APIs um, that would make it available when requested by another consumer or another domain that wants to consume that data. So next chart, please. So guiding principles then for this data-centric interoperability approach really is that we want to ensure that the data is decentralized, right? Not federated, not centralized, not aggregated, right? So each data domain where the data experts lie own their own data. Right, and they will curate their data and they will expose the data they believe needs to be exposed through data products to other domains and consumers. The other thing we want to make sure of, you know, for example, is consumers don't persist or duplicate or share the data products, right? The idea is the data, right, is provided by the data domain and it's the data domain that owns data. The consumer consumes it for their use. They may combine it, you know, as a data domain with other data and create a new data product, which then would have to be registered and made available. But the consumers don't rebroadcast that data from that data domain. It, if you want that data, you go back to the data domain to get it to ensure that, you know, we don't have multiple versions of data floating out there um, that would cause issues potentially with interoperability. The other idea is that data mesh implementation and data platforms will be consistent with modular open system approaches, right? The idea behind that data mesh concept and the services is that you know, these services can be updated, removed, put back in place without disturbing the whole. The idea is that this becomes a modular developmental approach uh, to the overall data centric system of system, I'll call it. And likewise, metadata is another key concept and principle that we need to make sure you know is is understood, and it's got to be tightly coupled with the associated data, right? And it needs to be able to allow for true understanding of what the data schemas are, 
so that the data can be understood by the consuming organization, right? And it also drives the data to be Voltus. So data, metadata is a key component of making this data centric approach successful. Next chart, please. So as we said, you know, now we've got a, a graphical representation of what we're talking about here. We have meta, the enterprise services, which are key to ensuring that we have governance and automated governance of the overall data centric approach here. Each data domain, while they own their own data and, they, and they're the producer of the data and they have their own local services that will allow them using their data platform to produce the data, expose the data, they have to do it in such a way that it conforms to the enterprise mesh service construct to ensure that that data will be interoperable across the overall uh, data architecture that we are setting up. And the data products then must be uh, conformant to the overall mesh services, as well as they must obviously be produced uh, by the producer in such a way that they meet the consumer's needs. And the idea that the data gets, you know, is provided to the consumer in an automated fashion, but the a key component of the data being consumed by the consumer is the understanding that the data either meets or doesn't meet their needs. If it doesn't meet their needs, the idea that there's a feedback loop to allow the data domain producer to recognize the changes needed is critical too to the continued growth and for the uh, utility of this process. Next chart. So, you know, mesh services are key in order to ensure we are managing the entire domain strategy of mesh, you know, data mesh and using the domains and having data products flow. And so these services are outlined here. As you can see, we have some critical components here of how uh, we will tag the data to ensure that we uh, provide unique identifiers for the data. We have services that will offer computational governance that which will check the enforcement of policies that have been established by humans to ensure that we have the you know, proper security, that the, val the product is valid, right? That it complies with the rules and regulations of classification, right? And the you know, data rights and sovereignty. And it, things like uh, feedback loop, right? We need to govern the size, you know, receive, store, process, data product feedback from the consumers so that the data domain owner can ensure that the data products they produce are of value to the consumers. And so really the mesh services, as it says in the tagline there, are focused on enabling the interoperable sharing of the data products between the data domains. Next chart. So if we look at the, so if we look at these mesh services that we just talked about, you'll, they're across the top in blue. And what you have running down in these columns is really the additional activities and tools that are required in order to achieve the uh, actual mesh service. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll take a couple of uh, use cases on these in a minute, but overarchingly, this is how we are envisioning these mesh services and what is needed to enact them and to enable them. Next chart. So if we go to a, you know, a user story here, pretty simplified user story, uh, and kind of lays out this concept of what these services do. And so what you see here is you see in yellow the data domain governed functions, right, services, and, and you see mesh governed functions or services, right? So and then you see your actors. So if you look at it, you know, the, the identified data need is identified by the consumer, right? It's identified and brought into the domain. The data domain owner essentially then, you know, creates a data product, right? That data product then is registered in the mesh services catalog and checked for computational governance, right? The concept then is, you know, it, that leverages the both human and we're trying to get to a computational machine to machine, you know, interaction at that point. And what they have, you know, the, what's actually in the mesh services catalog is just the data product metadata, as you see there. And then that data 
can be discovered as you know, and that data product can be discovered uh, by the consumer, right? Who is perhaps in another data domain could be a direct consumer, and the data product is used. As you see, then there's feedback provided, right? After they've re, re well, first they got to retrieve the data. I apologize. They need to retrieve the data product, and then they provide feedback. So the loop essentially, you know, closes with the consumer. It starts with the consumer identifying the need, and it's closed with the consumer providing feedback on that data product. And so that loop is vital in order, like I said before, to ensure that the decision maker is always getting the data they need uh, to produce the decisions required for us, you know, to fight the war fight. So next chart, please. So when it comes to how do we tag, you know, the 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 data product, and what we have to do is we have to tag it, right, with these metadata tags, and ensure that we have um, mesh conforming data products to achieve DoD uh, voltus, right, to make sure that's um, available. Uh, and and supports the goals for data centricity. And so we have what you see here more than the 10 that DOD require because in the Army Warfight, we really are, you know, have other things to consider like time to live for some of this data, right? We have the classification, I'm sure that's across DOD. We have, you know, those requirements we have to, the providence of the data we are concerned about, right? The, the lineage traceability of that data, right? And so these are the things that we have decided are required for a data product in order for it to be something that can be truly understood and can be cataloged such that the information that's provided by the metadata tags will allow the consumer to truly understand what they are getting and whether it will meet their needs. So if you go to the next chart, you know, kind of shows um, a use case here for us on how we would use, you know, register a data product and, and the different services that we would have to invoke in order to accomplish this. And if you see in the lower right hand corner there, you'll see, you know, the across the top, the mesh services, and then in the columns highlighted are the ones that are actually the actions that are actually invoked to support achieving that service. And so here we show you that we're registering a data product. I'm not going to go through each one of the steps, but it kind of gives you a feel for the flow of how we would register a data product in the data catalog, right? And the computational governance that would take place, you know, the, the understanding that we would have a guide service there to provide a unique identifier, a global unique identifier, uh, and then how we would manage access uh, you know, to the data product. So this kind of takes you through understanding registering a data product. If you move to the next chart, what we have then is the discovering a data product. So once it's been registered, how do you discover a data product? And again, you have the consumer, you know, begins with the consumer working to reach out to understand where the data product lies. So they go to the data catalog, the enterprise data catalog, um, which is managed, you know, as to what's in there, it's you know, managed through computational governance based on, you know, human developed policies and the data product access management once again. So these, this is what you would expect in the way of services that would be invoked in order to achieve discovery of a data product. And if we go to the next chart, what it lays out for us here is how we would re retrieve a data product. And again, what services would be invoked in order to accomplish that? And so the, the API brokers is a key component here because the API broker is what actually is, you know, is availing the data uh, from the producer to the consumer, right? And that API broker is, is, you know, the expectation is it's owned by the data domain, but that it meets certain um, computational requirements that would be governed at the enterprise level in order to ensure that the data would be discoverable and available, uh, and the understanding of the data translation would all be be accomplished in order to support the data being produced by the producer and then making it available to be consumed by the consumer. 
And then if you go to the next one, what we show here is, again, what services would be invoked to provide feedback. And once the consumer has consumed the data product, that feedback loop is important to us to ensure that we continually improve you know, what is being produced by the data domain producer and does it meet the need? If it doesn't meet the need, what needs to be changed? The idea is that you know the producer will produce data products that are you know, products they want to expose, but if there's unique requirements coming back and it is fed back to them you know, through this feedback loop, they have the prerogative to create a data product that meets the need of a consumer if the generalized data product that they have initially exposed does not. So what I want, I want to move now to the next chart, which basically talks about what's coming next. And what's coming next is essentially the document that is the Unified Data Reference Architecture version 0 0.3. The expectation that is coming out here very soon. The, uh, we are planning to try to release it by the end of this week. The idea that it would be going out to industry. So what my plan is uh, for those who would like to get a copy, what we'll do is once we have uh, placed it um, and exposed it, we will send out a link to uh, the forum leads here and so they can share that link and everybody can pull down the actual document that walks you through uh, the unified data reference architecture and gives you more specificity on the things I touched on today. And then we are going to have an industry day coming up. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, should be on the uh, two charts ahead. I, I didn't look. Can you go to chart 20? Yep, thank you. And so there's an industry day coming up that'll be held right now. The plan is one and two October uh, at Aberdeen, Maryland. And uh, the industry day there is to allow folks to have pulled down the UDRA version 0 0.3 to be able to review it and come and basically have their questions answered. Uh, additionally, we are planning to move forward with a full blown publication of the version 1.0. Uh, probably won't be in October. Uh, I think uh, more likely it'll be December timeframe. And then that'll be our first instantiation that we plan to ensure gets out to all the PEOs and we begin discussing making sure these are part of contract vehicles and the like. The other thing that's going to happen here in the near future, if you go to the next chart, is that we'll, we are making sure that this whole unified data reference architecture is uh, going to be in a digital engineering model. So we are using Cameo Magic Draw in order to ensure that when we release this, we will also be releasing um, the digital engineering version of it so that it can be leveraged at, you know, as part of the design efforts of these of vendors and programs. So if you go to the next chart, please. So the concept you know, about what we're trying to accomplish here is establishing a way to move data centricity, right? That is soldier driven as the consumer and ensuring that domains that are the experts in their data and their data products are the ones producing the products for consumption. And they are the authoritative sources and remain the authoritative sources for the data that comes out of their domain. So at this point, then that's all I have. I will open up the question. I saw things popping up in the chat, so I don't know how how you want to work this tie or we um, we walk down the chat or just open it up. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Drake. This is Captain Hollingsworth here. So yes, we will run down uh, with the questions that weren't answered in the chat. And of course, if there are any questions that pop up in anyone's uh, mind uh continue to put them in the chat for sure but that was a very interesting and informative uh brief and uh we're going to go ahead and start with the first question so a, a mr leo ramos de guzman are you able to hear me yes i can hear you okay great all right and so i believe on on slot on the slide where you uh we're discussing uh, defining the 
UDRA and why it's important. He asked if the CONOPS uh, were going to be made available. Um, we, I have, I'll check with the Michigan Command Center of Excellence. Uh, I believe it is uh, releasable, but it, it's not a document that we own. So I'll have to check with the Michigan Command Center of Excellence for the data driven, uh, decision driven data conic, excuse me, to see how its releasability. So I can get back with you. That would be great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And next we have uh, Everardo uh, Segueda. He says, or he asks, metadata is clearly a major key to the Army's data-centric approach. What metadata standards or key metadata uh, has been identified to power this effort? So we're using the uh, metadata from um, the, let's pick the uh, common operating sure. environment um data uh well, that's our data model, and more, yeah that mit the and it's going to be the multinational interoperability program uh data model is what we're using for the data mesh um standards well so for the metadata we actually define the metadata in the udra uh version uh 0 0.1 0 0.2 and again that will be highlighted in 0 0.3 which will be available on the 15th of September. Um, the metadata aligns with the OSD CDAO minimum viable product for the 10 fields that they have, I identify, they have identified. We align with that and we have added a few more. Um, as you can imagine, uh, if we wanna share data with international partners, we're gonna have to have classification levels, we're gonna have to have pedigree. So you will see additional metadata markers that will allow us to have that clarity and that ability to actually start computational governance to make sure the right people get the right data at the right time. Over. Thanks, Bob. That's Bob McKee. He's one of our uh, SMEs from MITRE working on the UDRA. Great. All right. Next from Major Jonathan Clymer. On slide eight is the data platform fabric, less of the printing press to represent the ecosystem where data is codified into data products and more about the librarians uh, processes to build card catalogs and the checkout desk question. Steve, you want me to take that one too? Yeah, please. So yeah, you are 100% correct. Um, this is not a totally automated process. There are new people, new roles, new personas. We've actually attempted to start identifying them in UDRA version three. Um, you know, mind mind you, we are a salt. We are the M in the dot mil PF uh, chain. So we are also working with our CIO CDO office, our uh, uh, um, Army Future Center uh, Future Center Command, with and our trade trade ocean partners in and making sure that we stay aligned with operations as well as um, processes and and the technology so um, take a look at that it's a great stake in the ground i'm sure it'll change rev one of the udra architecture will probably be out by the beginning of this year and I'm, and i mean january um, and we are hoping to keep it as a live document where we will update it quarterly with lessons learned because once you create a concept like this, once you create a reference architecture that gives right and left boundaries, you're going to have to start doing trades and you're going to have to start implementing technologies and you will see further guidance on that implementation coming from the DASA DES office. Thank you. Perfect, thanks. All right, and we also have one, uh, another question that rolled in from Stephen uh, Goodfriend. Uh, he asks, is there any work being done to synchronize with the DAF efforts for a data fabric mesh? 
damn it. Can you? Staff is Department of the Air Force. Ah. So I'm I'm familiar with OneNet and Unified Data Library because I'm MITRE and MITRE talks between Air Force and Army. Um, for your data fabric construct, I again, I I'm I'm saying we're not bringing all data into one location. I'm saying the data will reside within the data domains. That would probably be our only difference. Everything else, you will be able to extract our data by going to our data registry, our metadata registry. Everything else would be the same. If you are going to do data orchestration with data products and metadata, if you're going to do data orchestration with data sets and authoritative data sources, well, now we have a concept, a problem with understanding the content because you've brought that all in and are persisting it in one location. Do, do you understand the issue that I'm bringing up? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, you know, the talks with Derek Eichen and Dr. Giddings and so forth, they've sort of indicated that that they're going with a data mesh approach. They're just calling their branding it a data fabric for their purposes. So I don't think there, I don't believe there's a conflict in philosophies there over. Right. And and if you do, and if your data product maps our data product, then we can both do data orchestration the same way. We don't have to change anything. And and if we can, if the Air Force and the Army can do that, um, and maybe the Navy, and then guess what? All we have to share is our data product registries with the joint force. And the joint force now can do JADC2 because essentially they now have access to all the data that has habitually been hidden from them because it's been hidden from us because it's trapped within the programs of record. Over. All right, and uh, next question from Mike Edwards. You touched on the value of data and products. If you take that and use a data and information concept, would it not help to have that mindset to inform where processing should be and create better bandwidth usage with a focus on moving into moving info instead of data? So with the data product methodology, you because you have how the metadata is and the data schema, how the metadata is exposed, or how the data is exposed, you you don't have to pull the whole product into one central location. You just pull the information you want. It could be as you know, if we we're using the book analogy, it could be a paragraph on the 15th page, you know, the third paragraph down and the fourth sentence. You don't have to pull the whole book. That's the beauty of this mesh approach. Now, the problem with with information is is this. What Intel calls information, what Mission Command calls information, what the Air Force calls information is not the same thing. So if we adopt a common way of doing data products and do data orchestration from data products, then I think we are going to do exactly what you're you're trying to drive at, where you get raw data, then you get process data, then you get information, then information is fused to become actionable intel. The actionable intel is actually what the data product becomes. Within the data domain, there may be many products that are produced that are consumed by the data domain to build an actionable product. Maybe maybe I've answered a question or maybe I've created more confusion, but we're trying to minimize the extraction of data and movement of data through our networks because our networks uh, have limited bandwidth and sometimes long leg, uh, long latency 
And we have to be cognizant of that because most of our data is, is um, trans, uh, transient and or um, transactional. And because it is, its life expectancy is not high. Does that make sense? All right, Mr. Edward says yes. And uh, in reference to the industry day um, event that you have on 3 October, is there a link um, that people can visit to get more info? Yeah, I, I think we could share the link. Um, we have right now, I, I think it's on mill.gov. We have uh, saved the date announcement. We can send that out. Um, and and uh, mill.gov is also going to be where we place the UDRA as an RFI. So you, you, you'll, I'll, we'll try to get you both links over. Great, thank you. All right, and I believe that's all of all of the questions we have. Um, last chance, last call. If there's one more. Hey, hey this is uh, Dan Winkowski. Is um, can the Air Force hand have a representative at the industry day as an observer? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah there's we, it, it's there's open. no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just FYI, OSD, um, uh, C CDAO comes regularly too, just to see who's who's there and what they're presenting. Uh, by the way, Bluestack actually responded to uh, all, all of our RFIs with some very good and helpful information. So, yes, please come. Wonderful. Well, again, we thank you so much, Mr. Drake, and we thank you, um, Mr. McKee as well, um, and everyone for joining us today. We are so very grateful for your support of DOD Innovators and Innovation Connect. We have several pioneering projects underway and anticipate featuring even more in the future. Join us for our next Innovation Connect event on October 12th, including a special SBIR advisors presentation. To stay up to date on upcoming events and registration information, follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Approved videos of our past events are available on the Department of the Air Force CDAO YouTube page. We invite you to submit recommendations for future Innovation Connect topics to our DAF uh, CDAO communications mailbox. Thank you for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you, Captain Hollingsworth. Appreciate it.